This training is not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor that of your attorney. Our instructor for this video is Kevin Burke. Let's get started. We're going to be talking about the October, December 2020 forms release. So we, we did have a uh, uh, what we call soft publish in uh, October. Um, as most of you know, I'm on the Zip Forms Advisory Committee. I'm also on the uh, um, Lone Wolf Customer Advisory Board, which is the group that now owns Zip Logics. So um, um, that's one of the things that qualifies me to be able to talk today. So um, uh, we did have a, a soft publish in October. It was one form. It was the FHDA, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then the rest of this was all published on the 21st of December. December. Um, so that being said, how did I get to this information? And this is the part that we forget to tell you about um, many, many times. Uh, and that is, you know, what was it that brought us here? Um, and I'm looking to make sure, yes, you're all still there. Good. Um, and I'm going to show you how we get there. Uh, Linda said to me, why do you show them that stuff? Because that's job security for you. I said, I don't need it. I got, I got enough job security. So this is my, um, when I go to my CAR platform, and that's what's missing. Where's my CAR platform? Okay. Here it is. All right, good. So when I go to uh, um, CAR, I am going to go to um, the uh, the home page. I'm going to log in. I'm then going to click on Transaction Center. And when I go to Transaction Center, I go over here and I go to Standard Forms. If I go here and click on the tradition, the Transactions, the Zip Forms edition for Transactions, boy, that's almost a hint that we got something new coming, uh, isn't it? Everybody, everybody understand we got something else that's on the on the agenda. But for right now, Standard Forms. I click on that link there, and it takes me. To, um, to where we are, where I find out what's going on with forms, okay? So that being said, down here, I've got my forms revisions and new form releases. Um, this is a, actually a very common question that I get from people asking me, you know, how is it, how do I get to, you know, that information? Um, in here, we're actually going to have the, um, um, the, for example, under the December 2020 quick summary, we're going to have what I just showed you a second ago, and we're going to get back to that, but then I also have the new forms and the revised forms in the red line version, okay? And so my caution to everybody is do not use the, the forms when they are in the red line version. Do not use the draft of the forms. Only use the uh, actual forms when they are released. Um, and we do have people invariably doing that where they will try to use the, the draft forms and that's going to create uh, problems for us, okay? So um, one other thing that I wanna tell you about is when I get into the, um, uh, looking for my zip forms platform here, when I get into zip forms, do, 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 is that it? All right, so now I'm gonna have trouble finding my zip forms again. I've already opened, there it is. Okay, so here's my zip forms program. Now, I want you to be aware that when we update the forms, so as we did in December on the 21st, we update them in your library, which is going to be over here uh, once you, uh, when you open up a transaction over here on the right-hand side, we will update them in the library so that all the new forms will be in there and the revisions will be in there, but we will also update your templates. So here's my template button. Um, so in my templates, all the forms I have in my templates, you can see I, I live on templates, all right? So all of the forms that are in my templates will also be updated. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. If you are living in the world of transactions and you have not been creating templates, then you're going to have some challenges later. So we have people who, who really like a transaction that they did, and now they keep copying it again and again to create a new transaction. I'm going to caution you against doing that. And the reason is that we are not going to update a transaction that you you have in progress. So if you have a, a transaction that you are working on, we're not going to touch it. Okay. So you're going to be using old forms. And I've seen this happen time and time again, and you will not have protection from the user protection agreement, the CAR user protection agreement, because you are using old forms. Okay. You need to use the more, the more current forms. Okay. All right. That being said, um, 
transactions. I believe in doing them, um, but I also believe in creating templates. And as you can see, I have quite a few templates in here. I have templates for buyers, templates for sellers, you know, things like that. So um, I encourage you to be using templates. One of the things you can do, you'll also see I have a, a template for uh, P forms um, for when I'm going to be showing property. So I don't have to keep on loading that. Um, speaking of that, the Glide program is going to be updated on the 14th. I'm doing a class tomorrow on zip forms, and I'll touch on that a little bit, but uh, the big update's not going to happen until uh, next week. So that being said, again, if I've got a transaction in progress, we are not going to update your transaction. So you'll be using the older version of the forms. And remember, that becomes really important when we start talking about the October release. So, um, but let's get into that. Let's go ahead and get into that. And uh, again, if you have any questions about any of this, you know, get a hold of me. Uh, let me know what your questions are. So these are my, um, this is my quick summary. It seems like there weren't a lot of things that were done this time. We'll have more that will come out in May. All right. But the ones that did come out are fairly significant. There's my December 21st date. Here's the link, by the way, I'm going to send all this to you, but here's the link to get to this chart. Um, but again, you don't need to do that. You just go to car.org up at the top, click on transactions, drop over to, to uh, the zip, uh, the, uh, um, standard forms uh, library. Okay. So that being said, let's take a look at what we're going to be dealing with. We're going to talk first about our new forms. Um, and again, as a matter of housekeeping, if you have any questions, you can uh, always unmute and then say hello, say something. Or if you just want to type it into the Q&A field up at the top, please feel free to do that. Okay. Um, so that being said, Glenn, how are you? Can you share what you have as a basic template for a buyer and a seller? Um, okay, yes, I can. In fact, um, Glenn, that's actually a really good question. Um, when, and, and I'm the, the program I just showed you is, is the program that I have for um, at car, as car.org. My office, we use the broker version. So I actually create the templates and then everybody in the company uses them. Um, so it won't have the more current thing. But when I say a template, and I, when, I, when I'm talking about a template in these terms, I'm talking about, for example, the, um, um, uh, when you pull up an offer uh, or you pull up a, a listing, um, I have templates for each one of those. And again, I'm more than happy to share that with you. Um, you send me an email. I'm not going to have the association send it out, but send me an email and I'll send you my templates, okay? Um, that being said, um, and, and the only reason I'm do, uh, saying that, Glenn, is because it's going to take me too long to open it. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I can find it here. Hang on. I'll do this just really quick because I, I'm, I'm sensitive to everybody else being in here. Um, when I go to my template, here's my template. So I will have a buyer offer template. I will have a seller listing template. Um, I don't know where it is. It's in here someplace. Again, I don't use this program. I use the, the broker version. I also have a minimum seller and a minimum buyer template, and that's the one one that I created for, you know, the, the stuff that you're going to uh, drive around with uh, in the trunk of your car, um, you know, that kind of thing where I'm going to have at least that, you know, when I click on an offer, it's going to pull up what my agency disclosure first, then we're going to see it's going to pull up now our fair housing disclosure uh, advisory, and then it's going to pull up my wire fraud advisory, and then my, uh, my uh, PRBS form, my consent for uh, uh, potential uh, conflicting offers and, and conflicting uh, sellers, uh, buyers and sellers, things like that. And then we get into the offer or then we get into the listing. So more than happy to send that to anybody that wants me to just send me an email uh, and I'll pop that out to you really quick. Hey, Terry, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So good. I'm going to take us back to what we're talking about. So let's talk about our forms. Uh, we're going to be talking first. Uh, we're going to talk about the the, um, uh, they've got the home hardening in there. I wanna talk about fair housing and discrimination advisory first. So we actually did release this form in October. It was, this, it was a, a new publish for us. Um, so it wouldn't have been available before. My big fight with everybody was, please don't use the draft version of it until you know, we, we came out with a real version, which we did. And we added this form, let me pull the form up for you. This is the final version. We added this form to all offers and, sorry, uh, all offers and all listings. We added that automatically to everything that we were doing in real estate. But again, that came in in October. So 
unless, and, and I kind of doubt that you would be nursing a transaction today that you had in process before October. But if you did have a transaction going on before October, I would encourage you, this is also a freestanding form in the zip forms library. I would encourage you to uh, go ahead and use that form as a standalone form. But when you look at the new offer forms and the new listing forms under all property types, you will see this fair housing and discrimination advisory, okay? So, um, and, I, and I like the this form, this is going to fall up there. I did a talk on this this morning, much briefer talk, um, but this is going to fall under the realm of, you know, it sure took us long enough to get around to doing this. I do speak on the issue of fair housing um, and, and remember that it's an important, it's incredibly important to us and it's amazing the violations that we see. Um, and some of those are not intentional. So some of the discriminatory um, um, Intent is not there, but the discriminatory effect is. And so I use as an example, I had an agent, one of our agents who was sending out a mailing piece, everything goes through me before it goes out. And I'm looking at the mailing piece and it says, essentially get out of the neighborhood while you still can. And so I contacted the agent obviously they hadn't sent anything yet and I said this sounds like blockbusting so and that's gonna that could be a federal fair housing violation um, and and so you know we, we we it wasn't their intention at all it just sounded that way so that's a good example of a discriminatory intent no there was no intent but it did have a discriminatory effect could have had could have been construed as being blockbusting it could have uh, created a problem for not only the agent uh, that, that innocently just wrote the words that just didn't work but it, but it uh, would have created a problem there. So um, the reason I like this form, there's a lot of reasons that I like this form. One of them is, is that this is California, but this is also the rest of the country. So this form we've made specifically for California. And in California, as you probably know, we have 22 protected classes. I'm pretty sure we have more protected classes than any other state in the, in the country here. Um, and, and so it's just amazing how we can fall awry of something. Um, I really think you should, as a homework assignment, I really think you should spend some time going through this form. There's a lot of really good information in here. The previous version, this was the sample version, the draft version. It has been updated. You'll notice here paragraph 8E, uh, um, the little, little III. Uh, we're going to talk about it in a second. Um, but uh, we're going to see that in the, in the new version, um, it's uh, literally almost a standalone 8A, um, which is what I was just talking about a second ago, discriminatory intent versus discriminatory effect. Okay, and we're going to talk about love letters. We're going to talk about um, uh, buyer interest letters. CAR has a really good uh, Q&A on it that they put out on the 28th of October, right after publishing this form um, that addresses a lot of those issues. And, and again, really important reading. For most of you, we intend to be in this business uh, for quite some time. I'm looking to see, make sure you can still see my screen. Yes, you can. Got a question. Um, what are the 22 protected classes? Clara, that's a great question. Let's take a look. So when I look at my uh, look at my screen, I can see I've got federal and state laws prohibit discrimination against identified protected classes. So this is going to go through the Federal Fair Housing Act. Now, folks, my ears are up. Think about it for a second. If you break this rule, you think that you have E&O insurance to cover it. And the answer is you probably do not because remember it's a fed, it's, a, it's against the law. And so remember your E&O doesn't cover you for uh, acts against the law. So here's my California Fair uh, Employment and Housing Act. Here's my uh, UNRWA Civil Rights Act, the American with Disabilities Act. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. I, I spoke uh, earlier today about Somebody asked me a really good question. They said, well, um, I understand that we can't say walk to beach. And the answer is you can, but you may not, right? Because walking to beach uh, is uh, protected by the ADA, right? That not everybody is able to walk. And so you know, I have a problem with it only because I can say ocean view and yet not everybody is sighted, right? So not everybody can see, right, is sighted. Um, so I think that's a violate, that may be a violation as well. But walking to beach for sure is, is one of those things that gets called out a lot. When you put your phone number down on your business card, you know, do you have hyphens in between the numbers? Remember the hyphens in between the numbers, according to the ADA, makes fours look like sevens. So periods are where we have been going for quite a few, quite a while now, quite a few years, you know, you're, so your 858 P 
period, and then 509 period, and then 7500 would be more ADA compliant. So um, it's a whole nother subject matter. Uh, Samantha, would pre-approval letters be required prior to selling uh, be a violation of fair housing? I'm going to talk about that in a second, Samantha. That's, that's a good question. Um, and, and so, but let's do talk about that because my comment to Gov Hutchinson in a forum that I was in um, on this subject was that at some point we're going to get to where we're going to uh, bleed out the names of people on the offers because the names could allow someone to discriminate against somebody based on last names or first names or whatever, you know, it's just getting kind of, some people think it's getting kind of weird. Um, I don't know. I think it's us evolving as a, as a, uh, a culture. So um, potential remedies to answer uh, your question. Um, well, I said a second ago, you know, there's a lot of problems with, with this, but here's, here's going to be my protected classes in California. So uh, when I get down here into, um, and, and some of these things are things that, that you, you might have remembered that we did at some point in the past uh, where we were doing things. So we had a lawsuit not that long ago um, where the, uh, buyer, uh, the buyer was uh, wrote an offer on a property. They, um, they um, um, sent along a love letter. They sent along pictures of the family. Um, and then, of course, their offer was not the successful offer. And, uh, the seller chose another offer. In fact, they chose another offer for less money, but it happened to be somebody that they worked with and somebody they were comfortable with. Well, it resulted in a lawsuit by the buyer. The buyer saying, of course, that uh, you uh, discriminated against me because of my national origin. Um, and you know what? The seller had the picture, you, you know, okay, I get it. All right. But that's what, um, you know, that, that was the lawsuit, uh, the outcome of which I believe most of these everybody settles. As I said in a, in a webinar with uh, our, our deputy commissioner, Veronica Kilpatrick, um, I just made a comment in the chat line and then everybody, you know, it, they actually read it out loud to the group. But, uh, you know, and that is, you know, you don't want this case. You don't want to be involved in this lawsuit. This is, this is going to be an incredibly difficult to defend lawsuit, um, whether you intended it or not. So back to my discriminatory effect. So um, notice over here, source of income, for example, Section 8 vouchers. So, you know, little things like that. I don't know. It's a big thing. There's a lot of people that are on Section 8. And so, you know, we just accepted a Section 8 tenant in one of our properties. We love it. They're, they're great people. Any arbitrary characteristic. So, you know what, that's just kind of in California, we just say, okay, we're going to create this great big bucket, right? Everybody that we didn't cover here, then we'll just go ahead and cover it there. We actually had an attorney who sued uh, a seller. Um, the seller had multiple offers on the property. The, uh, the, the uh, seller was aware that this one buyer was an attorney. Um, the seller chose another offer, but made the comment, I'm not going to sell it to you because you're an attorney. Um, so um, I would counsel against saying those kinds of things, <laughs> no matter who it is, but the seller actually made that comment. And of course, then the attorney sued and said, I am in the any arbitrary characteristic class and therefore I, de I deserve um, protection from the law. Um, the court did not agree with the attorney. The attorney was not successful in that case. But again, you know, it costs money to defend these things. So we want to make sure that we are sensitive to what, what these issues are. Okay. So um, to answer your previous question, here are, here's my list of protected classes in California. Okay. All right. And, and look for it to change. And when it does, we will change all of this as well. So paragraph number five, DRE requires training and supervision. So, you know, I've had the training, uh, you know, I know our broker at it. Um, and, uh, you know, and the DRE is just going to come out and say, you know, if you get nailed for this, we're going to take your license too, because you've broken the law. Uh, realtor organizations prohibit discrimination. NAR Code of Ethics Article 10 discusses this very fact, okay? Who's required to comply? Pretty much everybody should comply. There are going to be some exceptions to that. For example, if you're renting out a room in your house, you don't necessarily have to comply. But the minute that you hire a real estate agent, now you've got to comply. Okay, uh, question, uh, bum, 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 bum. Uh, Samantha, I'm gonna get to your question. I'm heading there right now. Yolanda, my uncle is, uh, oh, wow. Uh, William Byron Rumford, Rumford Fair Housing Act. 
go. I got it. Good for you. Um, okay, so uh, examples of conduct, and this is one of my big pet peeves, and, and I've got a real problem with love letters, a uh, real problem with buyer interest letters, where the buyer sends over that letter that says, you know, uh, hey, you know, here's my lovely family. Oops, family, that could be, that's a, that, I think that falls under my protected classes, right? Familial status right here, folks, family with children's. So that may be a protected class, okay? So you know what, like I said earlier, you may unwittingly find yourself in the middle of a mess um, if you allow those love letters. So take a look at paragraph number 8A. Prior to acceptance of an offer, uh, asking for or offering buyer personal information. So the seller or listing agent asking for personal information, by the way, which includes letters from the buyer, especially with photos. Um, we've got a case in Hawaii where they had videos um, of the family, that kind of thing. You know, and, and again, this, these are things that we did in the past with, with much more innocent intentions, but our goal was to try to get our offer accepted to separate ourselves out from the rest of the offers. Today, our feeling is write an offer that accepts that that ex accepts yourself from the other offers rather than appealing to the to the uh, uh, senses of the of the uh, seller directly. So, um, I mean, I want to talk about this. Let me let me just cover a couple things. Uh, these documents, these types of documents, may inadvertently reveal or be perceived as revealing protected status information, thereby increasing the risk of actual or unconscious bias, we are not going to know, and potential legal claims against sellers and others by prospective buyers whose other offers were rejected. And so the reason I'm bringing that out is because this is in real time. We are having this happen today. And I'm going to tell you that if you it, check with your broker, but you might want to have language in your listing agreement that says, no, I don't, you know, I, the seller's instructing you as the agent. No, I don't want to receive any of those love letters. I don't want to receive any of those buyer interest letters. Again, I'll make it available to you, the Q&A from CAR on this um, but it was well written. It was after I'd been speaking on this for two months. It was well written because a lot of it was what I'm saying right now to you. But you know, at the end of the day, um, you you um, you you may not refuse those types of things unless the seller has given you an instruction. Check with your broker, right? But it, the seller needs to give you an instruction that says, "I don't want to receive any of those things." And and when you have that instruction from the seller in writing in the listing agreement, then you can put it into the MLS in the in the confidential remarks section. Seller will not be reviewing any love letters or anything like that. Now, problem that we did encounter was some offers were coming in with the uh, with the buyer interest letters attached to the offer. So uh, the words uh, embedded with the offer um, where those were embedded with the offer. And so you need to also include that language that says that that uh, those offers are going to be uh, rejected outright and sent back to the original maker. Again, check with your broker on that, check with your attorney, but that's kind of our advice at the state and local level. Um, uh, Sailaha, what about people with emotional support animals? Um, I'm not there yet. Can a landlord still say no pets? No. Well, you can say no pets, but you have to. But remember, a service animal is, is uh, not a pet. It's an extension of the person. As a listing agent, and I apologize, everybody, I'm reading questions that are uh, coming through the queue. As a listing agent, what do you what to do when the buyer's agent submits buyer personal letters to you? Can you not accept the letter? So again, Joanna, I want to make sure that I have an instruction from the seller. I can't arbitrarily do that myself. You're opening yourself up to a lawsuit, and maybe even by your own seller who's going to say, well, I wanted that letter, right? Or why didn't you produce that letter when, you know, that was part of the offer that came through? You want to sit down with the seller with this form, have them go through this form and have the, and, and help them to understand that, that there, is a, there is an interest in not doing that kind of thing. So, um, okay. Uh, that being said, so paragraph 8A, you should take a look at that paragraph. Very important. Um, and then we go into some examples of unlawful or improper conduct based on a protected class or characteristic. So this is, you know, refusing to show a property. I mean, I think some of you are probably aware of the Newsweek uh, um, uh, hidden camera where, where uh, in Rhode Island they were uh, visiting real estate offices. And it was just amazing some of the things that, that people were saying, you know, like, uh, 
oh no, you don't want to live in that neighborhood. No, they're not the right people live in that neighborhood. Things like that. Um, I've I've always always said that when when somebody asks you a demographic question, uh, I would refer them to someplace, some government agency that is actually in charge of preparing demographics, because what you're going to do by trying to be helpful and by trying to answer their question, you might end up falling into. Uh, uh, a demographic question that's going to get you into trouble. You might have the best of intentions, um, but or you might not. Um, so I probably wouldn't do that. I would probably refer them. So like on our website, you know, we have a link to demographics. People can go there. They can look stuff up. Uh, and and they can get all that information. You know, schools is a good example of something that you know I just don't get into quoting whether or not it's a good school district, right? That's something for them to find themselves. Okay. Uh, question. Uh, let me see here. Let me. Uh, all right. So I'm going to move on from this because uh, I know we could do a whole class on this. Um, but again, I'm going to encourage you. Positive. Lots of fair housing resources. I'm going to encourage you to take a look at this form. Go through it. Uh, read it. It is part of your project. It is part of, of all of your offers right now. The next form I want to talk about is the is the form that was going to fall right up there with how come we didn't do this before. And this is the home fire hardening disclosure and advisory. All right. So here, um, fair housing, here is the sample version of it. And you're going to see that by looking at it, it's changed a little bit in the new version. Okay. So uh, here is the final version. So we've got four paragraphs under number one. Now, remember that this applies to properties one to four. So residential one to four, remember, is covered by California civil code. Civil code is intended to protect the innocent buyer and seller, right? So that's that's for the little guy. Uniform commercial code, which is five and greater, is designed to, to uh, work with people that are supposedly more savvy, more informed, you know, things like that. Uniform commercial code is, is kind of everybody be careful out there, okay? But as far as the, the um, uh, California Civil Code is concerned, properties that are built one to four, built prior to January, the first of 2010 that are located either in either a high or very high fire hazard severity zone. All right. Those are the are the properties that we're looking to be careful of. So if your property was was built after 2010, don't worry about it. You don't have to, you know, you don't have any need to do anything. Here's the problem. And this is the problem that comes out of your risk management committee at the San Diego Association of Realtors. So the, the issue is, is that it's going to require the seller to make a decision as to whether or not their property is in a zone. And, and we've even eliminated the natural hazard disclosure form out of zip forms because we really think that having a third party do the disclosure on behalf of the seller is probably a pretty good idea. You know, little things like uh, like uh, um, insurance, right? So remember that if the seller says the property is not in any zones and it turns out that it is in a zone, remember that the remedy really, remedy is a term of law, sorry, um, but the remedy really is pretty much the cost of the home, right? Because you can't move the house, you know, out of the zone that it's in, that the seller incorrectly identified that it wasn't in it. You can't move it out of the zone. So you pretty much end up having to buy the house back, that kind of thing. So, so be aware of this form. We've added this to our templates. Um, we had asked the home, uh, the uh, natural hazard disclosure companies to take on the task of doing this. At this point, I'm not aware of any that have, um, but we would, at your risk management committee, we would like to see them take this task on, but this is something you're going to have to be aware of. And again, I wouldn't be checking the boxes. I would use your Glide program, um, have the seller check the box. The seller, you know, I've, I've said this, to, you know, since the beginning of time, when you take your listing, get your natural hazard disclosure ordered right away okay because if you get it ordered right away remember that that's one of your statutory disclosures that's california civil code 1103.7 and if you give the buyer the statutory disclosure at the time of the offer they lose their three-day right to rescind the contract based on that information okay so so i would order my my natural hazard disclosure at the time of the listing which would be a good time for the seller to look at that document to fill this in. Remember, I'm going to have the seller fill this in. I'm not going to fill it in for the seller. I think by this point, we've grayed these out so that you can't fill them in, but you can send it to the seller and glide uh, and have the seller, uh, seller complete the document. 
uh, question, isn't all San Diego located in a high or very high uh, fire hazard severity zone? Um, thank you, Angela. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I think it is actually. I've been through enough fires in San Diego County that, like I said earlier, I think it's been, this form has been a long time coming. Um, I've been through quite a few of them, uh, some of them pretty really bad. I mean, they're all bad, right? But some of them really, really bad. So be aware that the form is there. Make sure that you are using it in uh, transactions involving property. So now remember the old rule. We always, we had those dates that we always tried to remember, right? We always had to remember October of 1988. Why was that important? Well, because that's when Mello Roos came in to San Diego County. 1978, why was that important? Because pre-1978 housing is covered by uh, lead-based paint uh, requirements uh, for uh, by the EPA, right? Uh, 1960 earthquakes, right? So in California, the earthquake uh, um, seismic reports um, have to be given. So now we've added another date, January 1 of 2010. So now you got four really good dates. You, I guarantee you, you're going to see this on the state exam coming up here in the next couple of years. I'm preaching to the choir because you all have your licenses. Please don't let them expire. Okay. So remember what I said a minute ago, when I want to get all my statutory disclosures done at the time of the listing, that's going to include my, my natural hazard disclosure, which means that's going to make it so the seller can fill this form out. The TDS is, of course, a statutory disclosure. Melarose is a statutory disclosure, usually included included in most of your natural hazard uh, disclosure reports. Um, all those things, folks, get those things done. Be, be a professional. Get all those things done at the time of the listing. That way, when the offer comes in, boom, you shoot it back over with the counter offer. Prior to the buyer committing the contract, now the buyer loses their rights of rescission. Okay, everybody good with that? Uh, any questions on any of that? Because I'm going to move on out of the uh, um, new forms and into the um, uh, existing forms. So let's take a look. So what we did here, I've got my, uh, we just did these two forms. Now we're going to get into the COP form and I'm going to show you how the COP form is actually what's going to create the changes to the contingency removal form, which is going to create the changes to the notice to buyer to perform. Okay. So we really only have one little block of forms here. And then we got two more forms to talk about, and those are going to be pretty easy. Okay. So let's take a look at my COP form first, because that's what caused all the problems. Here, here is the COP form. So, um, and frankly, uh, the Standard Forms Advisory Committee took it on themselves to work on this form, and I'm glad that they did. That form, I got so many phone calls from people saying, how do I fill out paragraph eight again? Um, and because it was confusing, right? And remember that if it's confusing to you and you have a real estate license, it may fail the test with the client. Remember that our contracts must be written in plain English. It's called the plain English doctrine, because if they're not written in plain English, then they're, then they're not going to be enforceable against the parties because there's no meeting of the minds, okay? Okay, so my contingency for sale of buyer's property, here's what the old form looked like before we revised it. And you'll see all the red that's in here. This was after we'd already started making revisions to the form. So my hat's off to the committee, Standard Forms Advisory, the CAR attorneys. I mean, they really took this. Look at all this red, okay? Now that doesn't mean that this was all new stuff. That, that means that this was stuff that we moved around, okay? So here's your old paragraph 7C. This was, you know, the, the, this was after we'd already started the modifications of the form you know, uh, uh, regarding the, the right to cancel or the right to um, issue a notice to perform to remove the contingency of the, the house to sell to buy, right? We always say the buyer has to sell to buy and that's what generates the COP form. You got to remember to do it. That's important. Okay. So that's what the red line version looked like. Let's take a look at what the actual version ultimately ended up looking like. And there were some changes to it. Um, again, make sure that you're using these forms that say revised in 12 of 20. All right. When you're, when you're doing your offers, when you're doing your contracts. So um, I like the way that they've broken this down. Uh, buyer's property contingency. Um, this, uh, this starts the conversa conversation. It's contingent upon another sale, another property. And then, and then under two, buyer entering into a contract for sale. I already see some things in here that we're going to have to adjust, but um, this is going to be a good first shot. Um, buyer entering into a contract for sale. In other words, you're not under contract yet. Um, and then, of course, uh, number three, which is my favorite, which is the, oh, it's not listed yet. Um, you know, that's usually the weakest position for the buyer is to be writing an offer on a property where they haven't even listed their home yet. 
Um, the most powerful position for the buyer, of course, is not having the contingency at all, but also having the uh, um, having their property under contract and all they need now is, is an address to put on, on that uh, transfer. Okay, so close of escrow buyer's property talks about that. Uh, status of the sale of buyer's property. You all know that we're supposed to be given the seller and the listing agent uh, notice of the transaction, the, the other transaction as it goes along, right? This says you within two days after seller's written request, but no earlier in time to remove the contingencies, buyers shall deliver evidence of the removal of those identified contingencies. So now we've got them talking to each other, which creates some problems for some people because you know we don't really want the, the new seller to, to necessarily know all that's going on in the, on the offer that the buyer has on their property, okay? All right, backup offer. So paragraph number seven, back to what we did. We actually moved this around a little bit, um, but now we've got it back to which box do I check on 7C? Uh, do I leave one in there, which says I can immediately give notice to the buyer to remove the contingency? Or do I have a delay, either 17 days or whatever the contingency period is? Those are very common. Or no right to notify. So in other words, during the entire term of the agreement, the, the seller may not give the buyer notice to perform on the sale of their home. And so people will do that a lot of times when when you know it's a pretty solid offer, and and, the, and again, it's this you know you need to counsel with your seller, get your seller's instruction. Don't just uh, be a lone wolf out there, so to speak. So uh, removal contingencies, all this is standard. Uh, seller's rights to cancel, buyer's right to cancel. Time for performance. This is the other gotcha. So time for performance. When do you want the time periods to begin? Um, when do you want the buyer to bring their deposit in? So do you want the time periods to begin? right away per the contract, or do you want them to, to begin the time periods after the buyer delivers to the seller the fact that they've sold their home? Um, and then the same as with the deposit, do they have it bring it in right away or three days after they uh, sold their home, that kind of thing, okay? So I like that, um, that we've done a really good job on that. Like I said, there's a little bit of confusion still in one and two um, that we're gonna need to have to address on that, okay? So again, make sure you're pleased using, do not use the draft version, make sure that you are using the uh, full version. So, so because of the changes that we made to the COP form, we now also have the contingency removal form is, has had to change. So my contingency removal form, let's take a look at the red line version so you can see not a lot of changes, but obviously because the contingency removal form is so closely entwined with the contingency for sale of, of the buyer's property, we did have a couple of things that we had to do. So down here in the middle, you can see where those changes occurred. The final result looks like this, looks very nice, it cleans up well, you know, that kind of thing, okay? So that's my contingency removal form. Try to keep that in mind. Some people are getting surprised when they go to send out the CR form and they go, wow, that looks like that might've changed. Um, of course, if you've been in on this class, then you know exactly uh, what the changes are. So then I have my notice to buyer to perform because obviously I'm going to want to give the buyer notice to remove that contingency at some point. Remember again, that that's going to be based on uh, this language down here in paragraph number seven, I might be issuing a notice to the buyer to perform to remove those contingencies. And so here they are. This is why I like the red line version, because if I'm confused as to, gee, what did we change when we did that the last time? At least I have this red line version. And again, keep an eye on your email. Uh, education at SDIR will be sending you these forms. Um, the, the, they're going to send you both the completed, the, the final version, as well as the red line version of these things. And again, this is another example of a document document that cleaned up well. It looks good, but um, obviously this is a, a result of the work done by the Standard Forms Advisory Committee at the California Association of Realtors and, and clearly the attorneys who kind of put everything in, in order. Um, I should also mention that we will start doing talks coming up, I think in May or June on the new uh, residential purchase agreement, which will be released in December of 21. So we are already excited about that. We would have released it last year, um, but we had kind of some blowback by the San Diego Risk Management Committee saying there's some things that we need to fix in that, and then COVID hit, right? And so uh, we focused all of our attention on COVID-related forms uh, and uh, making sure that we had everybody protected. We figured we could come out with this with uh, the new uh, purchase agreement later. So that's my notice to buyer to perform. A couple little changes in there. 
Um, as you can see from the red line version here, let's take a look at uh, back at what we're going through again here. Um, let's take a look at our rent cap and just cause addendum. Uh, first of all, I should stop. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions so far? I know I'm talking really fast, but I interrupt well. Um, I haven't answered questions about emotional support animals. Um, partially because this isn't part of that. Um, and, and by the way, for those of you asking questions about that, um, CAR again has a really good Q&A on that. If you're having trouble finding it, send me an email and I will send that to you. Um, but it is a very complicated subject and we wanna make sure that we're not giving legal advice to our client. I really like the concept of printing a Q&A. CAR, when they did the Q&As, they did it knowing that people are gonna be reading it. They also did it knowing that the public is gonna be seeing it as well. Um, some of it is behind a firewall, not all of it is. Alonzo, uh, your question is, will this be available as a recording? I, I'm not sure. Um, we were having some issues um, with my recordings in particular that uh, certain people were putting them up on their websites. I mean, I'm flattered by that, but uh, CAR had some problems with that. Um, so the answer to your question is, um, Go to the SDAR website, go to SDAR.com, and on that website, you'll see education. Scroll down to the bottom where it says webinars, click on webinars. If you're doing it before you've logged in, you see this is one of those little firewall issues, but if you're doing it before you've logged in, it'll take you to past webinars. So you can literally go in there and click on past webinars and pull those up. Plus, I can tell you our education department at SDAR is off the charts, the best I know of anywhere. And they have created a whole YouTube channel for all of these webinars and not just mine. There's some great speakers, some great uh, lawyers uh, at SDAR um, doing some really good subjects. So Alonzo, it should be there. If you want a copy of the recording, send me an email. I'll try to get directions on how to get you to it. Um, as I have said before, we do a lot of really great things, but then we, we, we think, wow, that was really good. We tuck it away and then we move on to something else, but we forget to tell you where it is. And that's my biggest complaint about real estate, organized real estate is that, you know, well, we really need to make sure it's easy for people to find it, right? Kind of like that plain English doctrine and contract. I think that we need, need to make it easy for people to find these resources. I had somebody call me the other day and they said, you know what? They said, I've listened to every one of your uh, videos. And I'm like, wow, I'm impressed. That's a lot of stuff. You know, everything has a different subject matter. So the purchase agreement, for example, paragraph by paragraph, I've gone through the purchase agreement, the listing agreement, the buyer representation agreement, uh, major disclosure forms, things like that. Um, and, and those are things I think that are really important in, in yours and my business, disclosures especially. When I'm in court, it's because somebody didn't disclose something. So um, we want to make sure that those are available to you. Um, and, uh, and again, the huge YouTube channel on it, uh, as well as um, uh, SDAR's own website. You can also send an email to education at SDAR.com and ask them for it. That's the easiest thing to do, okay? So, all right, so let's talk. I hope I answered your question, Alonzo. Um, so let's Let's talk about a rent cap and just cause addendum. So you'll all remember that last year on January the 1st, uh, actually the previous year in, in November, um, our current governor uh, passed uh, essentially what amounted to the beginning of statewide rent control in California. You know, it's been, it's been going on in San Francisco and other parts of the state. And then uh, the governor decided he wanted to make it part of the entire state. So the, the camel under the tent kind of thing where, the, uh, where now we have statewide rent control. So um, as a result, again, hats off to CAR attorneys, they had to move really quickly to come up with what was the, the rent cap and just cause addendum, the RCJC. Um, and so that form is really important to protect your, your owner's rights, whether they're a seller or whether they're a landlord um, or whether you're representing them as a landlord. So here was the old rent cap and just cause addendum as we began to edit the form. Okay. Remember again, please use, you know, moving forward, please use the forms from December of this year, of last year, December of 20. Okay. But look at all the red. Now, now again, as I said earlier, the red doesn't mean those are things that we changed, but what we did do is we did move them around. 
So in the old in the old rent cap and just cause addendum, we have the notice of exemption, which was actually down towards the bottom of page two, which confused a lot of people. So what we did was we really just moved all that stuff up to the top. All right. So in most cases, and again, I'm not giving you legal advice, but in most cases, the seller would want to check the notice of exemption. And if you don't check it, then then they're saying that they may not be entitled to the exemption. In most cases, they they are but you're going to have to have your seller look at that and decide if they are. Now, even with the rent caps on there, we still do at fault uh, reasons for termination of tenancy. So here's at fault. Here's no fault. There doesn't have to be any fault. Ideally, most times it's the seller is going to move and the seller or one of their uh, relatives are going to be moving into the property. Um, and that is a reason for getting rid of the tenant, assuming that there's no lease in place, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, and again, you know, we have the old law, you know, the old law from Schwarzenegger about 20 years ago, where he made it so that uh, if a tenant had been in a property for more than 60 days, you had to give the tenant, um, I'm sorry, more than more than 12 months, you had to give the tenant 60 days notice of termination of tenancy. And so, you know, it's going to be kind of ha had a really good question on this the other day, some overriding uh, things in here as well. So, um, so we have our no fault reason. Um, I had a lawsuit where the, um, where the seller told the, uh, at the time, the owner told the uh, tenant that they were going to move back into their house up in San Francisco um, and that they were going to move back into their house. The tenant moved out because the, the owner was giving them a justifiable reason for uh, terminating their lease. They'd been there for 30 years. Um, and so the tenant moved out. And of course, then the seller put the property on the market right after that and sold it. The tenant waited until the sale had gone through and then filed a lawsuit against the seller based on the, the uh, landlord tenant law in the San Francisco area. So coming to a theater near you, as I always say, um, but that's uh, one of, you know, again, let's be truthful with others, but that's what this was. This was a lawsuit based on the fact that the seller had told the tenant that they were going to live in the property when in fact they didn't. Um, so anyway, um, uh, and then just cause notices. So obviously tenant doesn't make a rent payment. That's going to almost always be a reason to evict the tenant um, and or, or a notice to cure, a notice to conform to the lease, uh, the terms of the lease agreement, things like that. So, so those are my big changes to my um, um, RCJC form. Um, again, please make sure that in transactions moving forward from December the 21st, that you're using the current form. This is what the new one looks like. Pretty good job. I mean, it's a, like I said before, it cleans up well. Um, there's my checkbox. Um, but again, I would have the seller checking that box. That would that should be something you should use with the Glide program. I think I mentioned earlier we're going to uh, a huge rollout of of Glide um, in on the 14th of January of this year. Tomorrow's class, I'm doing uh, the zip forms. I'm going to show you how to create templates and zip forms. Um, and uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about is is what's going to be coming in Glide. I'm not going to get into the full description of what's going to happen because they haven't launched it yet. But um, we will be covering, uh, we'll be touching on that a little bit, okay? So that being said, any questions so far? Um, I'm going to take us now over. I'm amazing me that so far this year, I've been on time, uh, uh, finishing our, our lectures on time, which is uh, very, very good for me. And sometimes go 15 minutes over and it's just too much. So let's take a look down here. I've got one more form left. And this one, again, is also going to fall. Since, since we know this square footage is the number one litigated issue against real estate agents, why do we mess with that? I mean, people, I see people chain, put things on flyers. We never put square footage on a flyer. I get it that the public, you know, a, a 2,000 square foot four bedroom is a very different house than a 2,000 square foot two bedroom, right? I get it, okay? And But the problem is that that whether we're right or whether we're wrong, we get litigated against because of, of uh, the square footage. So why don't we just be the source of the source, not the source? Why don't we just tell them where, where the information came from. I, I'm a big believer in this. I really am. You know, quote the source, especially when you're quoting a government agency, right? Because listen, can they sue the government? The answer is, uh, I don't know. I think you can, but I think that there's some limits as to your recovery for one thing. And I think also, I think it's a, a case where they don't tend to settle, right? So you're going to have to figure you're going to go the distance. So so when I've got my square footage, this is what the, um, the old form looked like as we were editing it. You can see that um, 
represent uh, uh, the seller represents that they're not aware of any measurements of the property, any other measurements of the property, acknowledge that they have read and received it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the buyer sign off on it as well. So let's take a look at the final version of this form. Um, and with the final version, again, it cleans up well. We've added a couple, we added actually a paragraph in here. If you look at it, um, notice that we had uh, um, four paragraphs above the box, but over here we only had three paragraphs above the box. So um, we have different sources of square footage measurements. So as you all know, I can have five different people go out there. I've had this happen. Five different appraisers go out to a property and all of them come up with a different result. Okay. So, so if I know that that's coming from people that supposedly know what they're doing, then why do I allow myself into that foray, right? So there are different sources of square footage. Um, how many times have you seen it? Uh, Carmel Valley, for example, the, the uh, buyer buys a house, now they're going to sell it. Um, and the square footage of the house is inconsistent with the square footage on the tax record, right? And so what happened? Well, the seller, you know, the, the developer offered an option of, of enclosing a patio and making another room out of it. But oh, by the way, somehow, for some reason, the county didn't pick up on that change, right? And so that has a lot to do with the taxes you're going to be paying and things like that. But it happens. It happens a lot. Um, so the seller is now saying it's 4,000 square feet. The county says it's 3,600 square feet. So now somebody's going to have to explain the difference between the two. My advice, my non-legal advice, check with your broker, but my non-legal advice has always been to, to put in what the county says. And if you're going to change it, so use tax auto fill when you input your listing, right? But if the, if the information that you put in there, if you're going to adjust it in any way for any reason, and make sure that you quote the source. The seller said, okay, don't, and, and again, I wouldn't be putting it on flyers, but if you're going to change it in the MLS, because remember again, if you use tax autofill, it brings in the tax record and what the tax record shows the, the square footage to be. Again, I, I had it happen. I had an 800 square foot uh, house in Del Mar. Um, according to the county, I'm looking at it, it's 4,200 square feet all day long, right? This is a big house, clearly not 800 square feet. So I made the change, but remember what I always say, if you change it, be prepared to defend it, okay? So it was much larger, it was clearly not 800 square feet, right? And so, you know, we all think, wow, if it's got more square footage, it'll be worth more money, but it may be worth less money to you because you may have to pay that money in, in defending litigation. So, so let's just make sure that we use the form, okay? Property lot size. I had a lawsuit on this. I am getting in all these lawsuits now. Lawsuit on this where the where the uh, buyer asks the seller's agent, how far back does the property go? And the seller's agent said it goes back over there to the fence. Now, we all know that fences don't necessarily, they may make good neighbors, but they don't necessarily make good property boundaries. You know, the people that are putting fences in are not surveyors. And sure enough, there were actually two more lots, unfenced lots, before you got to that fence. So essentially, the buyer was buying one third of the property that the seller's agent had represented that they were buying. So the seller's agent said it goes all the way back there to the fence. But unfortunately, there were two other lots owned by two other people, two different people, before you got to that fence. Okay, so that was just kind of a, a real wild statement to make, uh, resulted in a lawsuit. Uh, and the buyer was able to recover uh, damages on that. So um, again, another legal term. Broker's obligations, we don't have expertise in determining exact square footage. I've told you time and again, when I take a listing, I am required by my MLS to put in room dimensions. And I always hold this, the, uh, the tape measure. I'm an old guy, I, I hold that tape measure. I always hold zero. And then I give seller the other end of it. And I tell a seller, you're holding the business end. And they say, what does that mean? And I say, that's the end we get sued on. So let's be really careful that you give me the right measurement. Okay. Because we're going to write it down, <coughs> excuse me, on the listing input form, and you're going to sign that it's accurate. Okay. So again, I always hold zero. I always have the seller hold the business end of the tape measure. Okay. So those are the little things that I put into play in my practice to keep myself out of going to court. I like going to court. I make a lot of money there, but as a result, I don't make money if I'm, I'm one of the parties of the litigation. Okay. I'm usually there as an expert and I'm trying to keep you from going there. All right. So disclosure of measurements uh, and sources. And this is the big one. This is the grand finale here. This is where I'm going to put in now in zip forms. Obviously, you'll be able to fill this information in from the program itself. This is a PDF version that you're looking at here. But look at all my sources, public record, square footage, lot size. What are those pieces of information? Do I have a report? 
Okay, what about, uh, did I get it from the multiple, what does the multiple listing service say? If I've got a public record that's inconsistent with the MLS, I'm going to put those in there. Um, the seller says it's something completely different. Of course, the seller always says it's, it's more square footage, right? And then I have appraisers that come along and, and, and quote me square footage. So I'm going to quote the source. Remember what I said earlier, be the source of the source, not the source. So I want to make sure I quote the source of that information, because if I quote the source of that information, that takes a lot of that liability off of me. And listen, we love our broker. We want to make sure we protect our broker. So check with your broker, but I'm going to, I'm going to bet you that your broker is going to agree with what I just said. Okay. So then down here at the bottom by signing below, the seller says, I don't know nothing about this. Um, and, uh, and that they've received a copy of it. Uh, and then the buyer signs a thing saying, uh, if no information is provided, and by the way, this is important, uh, and, and or any of these measurements are material, the buyer, buyer is strongly advised to investigate the validity of this information. So if nothing is filled out, then this becomes uh, an advisory. Um, if something is filled out, then it becomes a disclosure. Okay, so those are important things to remember. Um, questions about any of that uh, in my balance of time here, I've got a little bit of time left to answer any questions that you might have, anybody. Thank you all, have a great day, take care for now. Need more help? Contact SDAR Member Services at 858-715-8040 or membership at sdar.com.